Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Luke. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to like the fourth talk of our talk series. Um, today we have two speakers, Shakti and Hussain. Hussain will be joining a bit later, and uh, both of them are from the Vanguard AI research team. So Shakti is a research scientist at the Vanguard AI research team, where he works on fundamental and general purpose machine learning problems. His special uh, specific interest areas are optimization and the unsupervised learning of talent attributes. He obtained his master's degree in applied computing from the University of Toronto, where he was also the recipient of the prestigious Victor Scholarship in AI. Our other speaker today is uh, Hussein Zaidi. Hussein is a principal scientist in the Vanguard AI research team. His interest areas are quantum computing, low latency programming, and overlap of machine learning and quantum computing. He obtained his PhD in the theoretical physics from the University of Virginia, and he was a Max Planck scholar in Erlangen, Germany. So we're really excited to have you both here, and I think you can get started. Go, oh, I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Avinash, and thanks, guys, for having us here. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. And uh, let me know if this is good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us here again. Uh, my name is Shakti, and uh, I will have my colleague uh, Hussein here as well in, uh, in a few minutes. And uh, today we'll be presenting on uh, our latest work on few shot learning, which we call as uh, GDC or generalized distribution calibration for few shot learning. So quick introduction to the team. Uh, Hussein, uh, as Avinash said before, is a principal research scientist and he's based off the Malvern office in Pennsylvania. And I myself work uh, from the Toronto office and we're both a part of the uh, Vanguard AI research team, which is like a uh, the uh, team that works on fundamental machine learning methods with uh, use cases across Vanguard. So this is the outline that we'll be following. Uh, we'll set the motivation first in uh, the problem statement, and you know then we'll cover the state of the art uh, uh, for that specific problem, and with the limitation and drawbacks of the existing uh, methods, and then we propose our algorithm, and you know we finalize uh, comparing our results with the current methodologies. So let's get started. Um, so in data scientists usually uh, encounter, uh, you know, insufficient label data sets uh, in industry a lot. And uh, this uh, actually happens in uh, different kinds of problems like text classification or image reconstruction or trend analysis, et cetera. So here, if you see, we have like, uh, you know, lot, uh, a good number of examples for, uh, for this wolf, good number of examples for giraffe and for lion, but we just have, let's say we just have one example for a unicorn. So how are we, uh, how are you supposed to create a classification which should work equally well on all these classes? So that's that's a general problem in, uh, in, in academia as well as industry is insufficient labeled data sets. Now, uh, throughout this uh, presentation, uh, you know, we'll call all the classes which have lot you know, a lot of examples as base classes and the class which doesn't have a lot of examples as a novel class. So novel class typically has like only one example for, for each class or only five examples for each class. So that's how, bench, uh, you know, these algorithms are benchmarked. Now uh, it is, uh, you know, as you would have guessed, it is very difficult to productionize uh, robust machine learning models, which are trained on, you know, just one class, which is very small data set. And uh, this is an active area of research in machine learning. It's called few shot learning. That is, you know, you're learning from very few examples per class. And that's typically one or five. So you either have one example for each novel class or you have five examples for each novel class. So base classes are the classes which have a lot of examples. Novel class is a class with only few examples. So now uh, how do we, you know, um, uh, I mean, overcome this problem of having very small data sets. So first, you know, brute force method that, that naturally comes to mind is, can we not collect, you know, more, more data itself? And collecting uh, large label data sets can actually take months of effort, you know, and cost a lot of money and require a lot of expertise as well with people annually labeling them. And uh, so the next question is, uh, can we not learn a way to generate more data ourselves from, you know, the small number of 
let's say you have one image of a unicorn can i not generate more images of a unicorn somehow you know extrapolate with some data that we already have so uh, translating this uh, idea into a formal uh, i mean machine learning problem it's basically we need an augmentation technique to generate more labeled data from small data sets to train a machine learning model and that's that's the idea around the uh, you know these uh, uh, augmentation techniques to give give us more data based on the data that you already have so usually these data augmentation techniques um, um, fall into two uh, you know two major categories uh, and and uh, on, on a side note so feel free to interrupt uh, any time you know with questions or or we can even take questions in the end so in general uh, these uh, data augmentation techniques usually fall into two categories uh, the first is uh, with using deep neural network architectures and uh, uh, so with deep architectures it's either gans or generative adversarial networks or variational auto encoders where based on some data it will try to learn the distribution of that data and once it has learned the distribution uh, you can uh, you know you can uh, basically uh, uh, get new data points out of uh, out of this specific model itself now one obvious drawback because uh, you know it is a deep neural architecture so one obvious drawback is the design of complex models and loss functions with special training regimes you know to get them to work i mean it is very difficult to people in the vision community here would agree that it is very difficult to let you know to get gans to work and uh, another problem with them um, as as is with any other large model is uh, is that of interpretability so they're all black box models you know which provide uh, limited to uh, no visibility into their decision reasonings so and and, and uh, keep in mind that we need to generate data from small data sets so we we need more unicorns from a single unicorn that's that's what we need so deep neural architectures are definitely out of question here so another parallel line of work uh, that evolved was uh, you know augmentation using existing data points and uh, people from uh, the vision community would uh, you know completely relate with this random crop flip etc you know to increase the number of examples that you have in your uh, in your data set or merge data with different noise levels you know to make your classifier more robust or interpolation between different features like feature smoothing or label smoothing so these techniques use uh, uh, you know simple uh, statistical techniques uh, but though even though they are simple uh, uh, an underlying problem as we'll see in one of the methods is that they make assumptions that only generalize in very limited settings and hence though they are simple they are in fact too simple to be applied to real world data sets so that's one of the problem with these augmentation techniques with you know that rely on statistical methods so expanding this uh, statistical method a bit further we can we have uh, very few data points and the way they learn is uh, um, i mean the way the way the, this process goes about is they learn the distribution from all the existing data so you have very few data points that's coming from novel classes you also have a lot of base classes which have you know good number of points you can either use all the base classes or some part of base classes and all the novel classes to estimate the distribution of this specific class and once you have estimated the distribution right you can you can sample as many points you want from that distribution so it's basically we have like let's, let's say you know uh, i mean two unicorn pictures here somehow we estimate the distribution and then we can sample as many unicorns we want and uh, the uh, the success of this method really depends on how good is your estimate of the distribution which essentially means how good images will you be able to or how good features will you be able to sample from the final distribution the better the better your uh, you know classification models will perform and this is this is the new data set so you will be uh, you know instead of performing classification on these few data points you can perform classification on these many data points now so you have you know you have abundant data now so that's the main idea behind learning these distributions so one such uh, statistical method uh, was the free lunch paper that was uh, published in iclr last year and uh, the author here uh, you know the authors here observed that the classes which are semantically similar in meaning 
So by semantically similar, I mean an Arctic fox might look somewhat similar like a white wolf or share some similarity with a Malamute, some similarity with a lion. And they saw that uh, the features that are extracted, um, uh, let's say from a CNN or from a wide dress net or some other kind of uh, you know vision architecture, the features did have cosine similarity in terms of their mean and their variance. So you see here an Arctic fox shares like 97% similarity in its mean with a white wolf, 85% similarity in its mean with a Malamute, and 81% similarity with a lion in its mean. So in an abstract way, this means that in the feature space, let's say if it's a D-dimensional feature space, white Arctic fox is actually residing somewhere near white wolf and somewhere near Malamute as well. And so it means that if we know the mean and covariance of, you know, white wolf, Malamute, lion, meerkat, jellyfish, we might be able to, you know, get some rough idea of uh, uh, what should the distribution of Arctic fox look like. So that's, that's the, uh, I mean, uh, idea behind this uh, distribution uh, uh, estimate. And with a rough idea of the distribution, we can sample as many points we want for Arctic fox. So you can uh, have your, uh, you know, you can, instead of having just one data point of for Arctic fox, you can sample as many points now and increase the, the data set. So here the base classes are all these, uh, you know, white wolf, malamute, for which you have like a lot of data points but you don't have enough data points for Arctic fox. So you need to learn where Arctic fox resides in the feature space. So these are base classes and Arctic fox is the normal class here. So now note that, uh, you know, even though this method uh, does not use any deep learning at all, and it still outperformed all deep learning methods until 2021. And this performance is, uh, you know, measured in uh, a few short learning uh, setting. That, so this in, in few short learning setting performance are usually measured in either five-way one-shot or five-way five-shot setting. So by now, I think you would be, uh, you know, uh, you would uh, be aware of that this short means how many examples per class and way means how many classes. So five-way one-shot means there are five classes and there's one example for each class. And what's your performance when you, uh, you know, construct a classifier with just one example in the training set for five classes? Or five-way five-shot means there are five examples for each of five classes. What's your performance uh, estimate uh, when you construct a uh, classifier on this training data set? So you see that you know it, it is outperforming. I mean, uh, it's, it's almost like ten percent significant, uh, uh, you know, gap with respect to uh, the trinet, which is actually a, 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 a deep learning method. So uh, compare in, in mini ImageNet. So mini ImageNet is, uh, uh, is a subset of uh, the ImageNet data set. And these are benchmarked for uh, you know, few short learning purpose. And CUB is a birds data set. So it has different classes of words. I think CUB is also class, I mean, derived from the ImageNet data set. And here also you can see like there's a 10%, almost a 10%, you know, um, I mean, jump. Even though, and, and this is just based on this intuition of uh, that classes which are semantically similar have uh, similar, uh, you know, similar means and the similar covariances. I'm sorry, I think there's a question here. Yeah, Louis, there's a question. Oh, yeah. oh, question. So the five-way, uh, one-shot, five-way, five five-shot, is that um, you got five novel classes among other uh, base classes yeah, that right. have many uh, examples? Right, yeah. So five-way, five-shot means five novel classes. Mm -hmm. And one example from each novel class, mm -hmm. and five-way five-shot similarly. So five examples from each novel class. Yeah, right. But you also have like many more base classes, I guess. Or with yes, you do have base classes, but for uh, few short learning benchmarks, uh, the classification performance is only estimated on the novel classes. Okay. Yeah. So you can still use base classes to you know to extrapolate or to uh, do uh, the other analysis that you want. But your test result should only be reported on the novel class. Okay, okay, thanks. So uh, moving forward, um, now that you know to so so we said that these methods make assumptions which uh, you know which are too simple for them to work in the real world. So to understand the assumptions which these methods make, you know, and which limit their application to real world problems, uh, let's let's look at this paper a bit more closely. So here, these data points X, I, uh, these are the extracted features. So the images that we saw before, 
these are the features that are extracted. These XIs are the features that are extracted for those images. And YIs are the labels. So YI can be Malamute or uh, Arctic Fox or, or any other class or unicorn. And we've got the base class statistic as well. So mu i and sigma i are the mean and the covariance of each of the base classes, as we saw earlier. So uh, given a support set of k examples from, uh, you know, k examples from each of n classes, so n k short classification problem, uh, we first, uh, you know, Gaussianize the features. So they, they're Gaussianizing the features as in they're uh, uh, Tukeyifying it with uh, Tukey's ladder of powers. And this is because, uh, you know, at the end, uh, a normal distribution is constructed to sample points. So it will help if the features are a bit more normal uh, than, uh, you know, if, if it will help if we can perform some methods to make the features more normal. And uh, so now for a given training point, uh, you know, XI, YI, uh, let's say XI is the features of Arctic Fox and YI is a label Arctic Fox. Uh, we find the K closest base classes. You know, K closes base classes in that space. It can be Euclidean distance or, you know, any form of distance, find the distance and, uh, or even cosine similarity. So find the, the similarity, K closest base classes and put them in SN, a set SN. So here the K closes, let's say if, so K is a hyperparameter. And let's say if we assume K as three, then the three closest base classes to Arctic Fox is White Wolf, Malamute and Lion. So these three classes are in our set SN now. And then we calculate the mean and the covariance for um, for this for this class yi. So we only have one example. Let's say we only have one example for Arctic Fox. So now we need to extrapolate the distribution of Arctic Fox as an average of the distribution of White Wolf, Malamute, and Lion. And because they share similarity, right? That means uh, uh, there should be some way of extrapolating distribution from these three classes for this one for Arctic Fox. So this is the way uh, they do it. They actually uh, get, so mu i's are basically the means of all these base classes, white wolf, malamute, and lion. Sigma i's are the covariances of those base classes. And they construct mu prime and sigma prime. And then they say that, hey, this is uh, the mean and the covariance of your extrapolated distribution. And uh, now you can sample as many points you want from this distribution for Arctic Fox. So once you have this mu prime and sigma prime, you sample as many points and append it to the existing data set. So that's our augmented data set. And then uh, we uh, go about, uh, you know, report classification. You can construct any form of classifier uh, after that. You can construct an SVM or logistic regression or any form of, you know, classification model on these features. So uh, it, it does sound very simple. So now, now that we know the algorithm, like, so let's, let's look at the assumptions that they're making. Uh, the first assumption, which is uh, very clear here is uh, uh, this Tukey form of, uh, you know, making things uh, more Gaussian. It actually only works for, uh, uh, for non-negative features. So the features here, this, these X values, these X values uh, uh, have to be non-negative. That means the features have to be uh, have to be extracted from a feature extractor, which has ReLU or other, uh, you know, activation functions in its other similar activation functions in its penultimate layer or, or its final layer from where the features are being extracted. So that's a, you know, that's a big assumption that features will always be non-negative because I can use a wide dress net with a, with a different feature actor, you know, uh, with a different activation function, this method will not work. Secondly, it assumes that all the base classes that we saw are equally similar to the novel class. So white wolf is this, you know, the, the amount of degree of similarity of white wolf to Arctic Fox is the same as lion to Arctic Fox is the same as uh, a Malamute to the Arctic Fox. This way that they're calculating this mean and the covariance. So if you look at this, mu i's are just added. That means each of the base classes are having a weight of one by K plus one. So that's the weight of each of the base classes. So the degree of similarity information is actually going unused between uh, the base and the normal classes. Now it also assumes that all the base classes are independent of each other. And uh, this, this comes from, uh, I mean, you can add covariances like this only if X1 and X2 are independent of each other. 
so you're not taking the dimensional interaction between the you know between the different uh, 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 between the different dimensions yeah so let's say this is the covariance of white wolf and this is the covariance of malamate oh on a side note can you guys see my cursor okay sure yeah yeah so this is the covariance of white wolf and this is this is the covariance of uh, malamute so these are eight dimensions right so let's assume the features are eight dimensional so covariance will be eight cross eight now um, so so this form of uh, you know adding uh, adding uh, the different covariances is possible only if let's say d2 and d5 do not have any interaction between them which is actually a very hard uh, assumption to make i mean uh, uh, what if this is white wolf some version 1 and this is white wolf version 2 or or you know some some hypothetical uh, base examples which does have similarity between them and i mean it's not even hypothetical i think it's a very practical uh, you know uh, thing to to be uh, careful about so this form of addition will only work if all these dimensions do not interact among themselves and that's a big assumption so that's that's another limitation the third limitation we see that is uh, this cannot be used with any feature extractor and and by any feature extractor i mean that if uh, so for white wolf if this covariance has been calculated with seven examples so with seven examples of white wolf if an eight dimension feature if an eight dimension uh, you know eight cross eight covariance is calculated this covariance will be singular because the number of uh, dimensions are more than the number of features so so number of dimensions are actually more than the number of examples that were used to find out that covariance matrix and if this covariance is singular that means each of these sigma i's are singular and hence sigma prime is singular and because sigma prime is singular you cannot construct a normal distribution on top of it so these uh, you know these different rows are actually not independent uh they 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 can be written as linear combination of uh, you know of each other so that's that's again a big assumption that means you have to be careful about the kind of feature extractor that you're using for this method and that feature extractor should have the feature dimensions as less than the number of points in each base class that's the assumption here and the final assumption that they have is uh, this euclidean distance that they calculate this euclidean distance to find out uh, you know the k closest base classes for a given let's say arctic fox is close to which classes so how do you find that closeness uh, the 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 euclidean distance that they use to find that closeness it may not be optimal for arbitrary distributions so it may work for uh, you know for things which uh, it may work for one data set but it may not work for other data set or even other features uh, you know if extracted from other architectures neural architectures so now that we have gone through all these uh, you know limitations we can uh, go over our proposed solution so the first limitation that we saw was uh, it can only be used with non negative feature values and this is this is this is like a very straightforward solution it's like just use you know general gaussianization techniques it's like if uh, it's greater than 0 then use two key if it's going both the features are going in both directions positive and negative then just use yo johnson or other uh, gaussianization techniques the second limitation we saw was uh, assuming that all the base classes are equally similar to the novel classes so how would you exploit the degree of similarity between uh, the base and the novel so for that we can propose a weighted random variable and a weighted random variable i mean that instead of having you know equal weights to all these uh, all these classes xi are the points from each of base classes which are white wolf malamute and lion instead of having same weights try calculating some form of weight that depends on the similarity and here we propose this uh, weight as 1 over 1 plus the distance of that class of that class from the from arctic fox raised to some power n and if you look at this weight uh, i mean if if the distance goes to zero let's say if two classes are if a base class is completely overlapping with arctic fox then this weight becomes maximum at 1 that means uh, you know it's uh, uh, the the maximum amount of uh, metric uh, it's it's mean and the covariance uh, maximum degree of mean and covariance will be extrapolated from that specific base class if it's very close to the to the novel class 
And uh, the third limitation that they had was uh, they assume that all the base classes are independent of one another because they're not taking the, I mean, you know, the dimensional, the dimensional interactions are not being uh, accounted for. So here, uh, instead of uh, computing the covariance, like instead of adding the individual covariances, why don't you calculate the covariance of the final weighted random variable itself? So once you have the weighted random variable, which is basically weigh each of the points of uh, different base classes by their degree of similarity and get the new random variable. And once you have this random variable, get, get its mean and get the covariances by you know finding the covariance of this X prime itself. Don't add the covariances, that's all. And hence all dimensional interactions you know, are, are taken into consideration. And the fourth limitation was that it cannot be used with uh, any feature extractor. So no feature extractor can, I mean, uh, any, any random feature extractor cannot be used because uh, the dimensions have to be less than the number of points that are there in the base classes. And uh, to tackle it uh, in traditional statistics, there's, uh, there are concepts of uh, shrinkage where uh, if, if a covariance is singular, you can actually add some form of, uh, uh, you can do some addition to the covariance to make it non-singular so that you can, uh, you know, perform, uh, you can construct a normal distribution on it. So here we, you know, to, to troubleshoot this, uh, this issue, we borrow this covariance, covariance shrinkage intuition from, uh, from statistics and propose like an alternative shrinkage, which takes the covariance that we just calculated and takes the average variance, so average diagonal covariance and the average off diagonal covariance. And it weighs it with alpha one and alpha two, which are different hyperparameters. So alpha one and alpha two can be tuned for accuracy. And with this uh, you know, form of shrinkage, we don't have to worry about finding a pre-trained feature extractor, which has lesser number of dimensions than the number of points in a base classes. And finally, for uh, you know Euclidean distance problem, uh, we propose like a single hyperparameter m, which uh, will show that it can outperform uh, you know different forms of distances like Mahalanobis or Euclidean or even generalized distances that we've derived. So with all these uh, you know five limitations, uh, we're actually ready to summarize our algorithm now, and uh, it is given a support set, given a base class, given a set of base class features. So these XIs are random variables. That means they have, uh, you know, they can denote uh, any given point in that specific base class. And these are all D-dimensional points. That means D-dimensional features of uh, those uh, base classes. And uh, uh, so we have the support set features, which are, which are like K examples from each of N classes. So we have, got, we've got like, you know, n novel classes and k examples in each of n novel classes. So novel classes again, it's Arctic fox or uh, or uh, the uh, unicorn that we saw earlier. And base classes are the classes which have a lot of data points. So now for a you know training for a given training uh, data point, let's say this is Arctic fox, one example of Arctic fox or one example of uh, of a unicorn. Uh, Yj is a label. So YJ is the, uh, it denotes if it's an Arctic fox or, or uh, a unicorn. We first Gaussianize these features. So Gaussianize these features, you know, with use, use general form of uh, normalizing uh, that specific data. And then find the K nearest base classes using the distance that we just saw. So, uh, you know, uh, and put them in uh, SK. So earlier the K, the three closest base classes that we saw, let's assume K is three. It's a hyperparameter. So if K is three, the three closest base classes that we saw was White Wolf, Malamute, and Lie. So these will be in SK, set SK. And now we calculate the weights for each of these base classes using WI. So now we know what's the degree of similarity of each of the base class to an Arctic Fox. And once we've calculated the weight, we find the, you know, this weighted random variable, which essentially means that what's the what's the weighted combination of all these base classes? It's, it's this random variable is denoting the weighted combination of each of those, uh, you know, the base classes that are close, that are similar to Arctic Fox. And then once we we know this uh, this weighted random variable, then we can calculate the mean and covariance of this weighted random variable. And because we have the mean and covariance, we can 
we we still need to shrink this covariance because this can be singular. So shrink this using average of diagonal variance, average diagonal variance, and average of diagonal covariance sigma. So once you have shrunk it, you have the covariance, you have the mean, you can construct a normal distribution on it and sample as many points you want for Arctic Fox or for, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for Unicorn that we saw earlier. And uh, you sample as many points you want, you append it to the existing data set and now you're ready to construct any form of classifier that you want on top of it. And this is the augmented data set. So to, uh, you know, to, uh, so, so with this algorithm, uh, it's it's surprising that uh, the results that we got is 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 almost three to five percent better than uh, the uh, existing algorithm uh, distribution calibration. So our method is an incremental method based on DC, and we see that uh, with GDC, GDC is actually outperforming uh, you know all different uh, all all previous methods in this statistical technique. Uh, and even you know deep neural architectures for doing this form of classification across Stanford Dogs, CUB, many ImageNet. So Stanford Dogs is a fine grained data set where there are different uh, breeds of dogs. CUB is different breeds of birds, and many ImageNet is a subset of uh, of uh, the ImageNet data set. And we're even outperforming you know uh, I mean in in uh, cross domain data set. So we learned how to perform this method on many ImageNet. And we test it on the birds data set, and we still outperform the you know the the in in five way one shot setting by by almost one percent. So that's 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 the new state of the art that that we're discussing. So now uh, you know one one question exists uh, comes comes to mind is okay. So DC GDC is performing better than DC. That means the sampled points of GDC should be close to the test points compared to DC. That's that's a natural question. Otherwise, where is this uh, you know accuracy improvement even coming from? So this is uh, uh, this is the uh, TSNI plot for five randomly you know sampled novel classes in mini image data set, and the stars that you see here are all the query points, and uh, these uh, trans uh, you know these translucent uh, uh, I mean dots that you see are the sampled points. And uh, the uh, the plus with these uh, black circles that you see are the support points. So support point, as in these are those x i y i based on which the distribution was constructed, and these dots are the points which were sampled from the distribution. Now here you see that these dots, these blue dots, are actually a bit further away from these blue stars. Blue stars are the test points, and if these blue dots, you know, come closer to these blue. Uh, stars, then your accuracy will go up because uh, you can, uh, I mean, have a better estimate of the classification boundaries. Similarly, these red dots have to be closer to these red uh, stars, pink dots to pink stars, and so on. And these are, you know, these different colors mean different classes. So uh, this could be Arctic fox, this could be unicorn, and 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 same in 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 uh, you know uh, similarly in the other classes. So this is the visualization for DC, and this is the visualization for GDC. So if I flip these two, you can clearly see that GDC is producing points which are closer to these stars. That means GDC does have a better estimate of the ground truth distribution of these, uh, you know, of these novel classes with just one point. I mean, there's only one point of unicorn. There's only one point of uh, of uh, you know, Arctic fox, and it still has produces points which are closer. Similarly, uh, I mean, another example. So this is this is a different, uh, you know, another randomly sampled five classes. And still you can see that, you know, with GDC, these blue move closer to the, to the, to the, to the, to these stars, which are those test points. Even green cluster moves closer. The, the, the red cluster move closer as well. And that's, that's where the accuracy improvement is coming from. So the three to five percent accuracy improvement that we see, that's because the points that our method is sampling, that's close to the query, close to the ground truth, or close to where they should be in the feature space. And uh, uh, so another ablation study that we did was, uh, okay, so there are so many things that we're performing. Where, what are the, you know, significant, what is, what is the significance of each of those components in this entire method? 
so we see that with gaussianization um, uh, you know uh, we we train on uh, so with gaussianization we we've got like a, uh, i mean this is the base um, uh, i mean accuracy so you just perform uh, the gaussianization step and we got like 60.44% accuracy for stanford dogs data set and once we you know select like the k closest base classes and do not do anything else don't do anything else but only select k closest base classes and do the same method we get an accuracy improvement of around 0.8% and once we introduce our weights to those k closest base classes we get another improvement of 0.7% with shrinkage that's where the maximum accuracy improvement comes from so with shrinkage shrinkage is uh, giving us an improvement of around 1.5% and this means that shrinkage is not only helpful for stabilizing covariances and you know making non singular cases to sing making singular cases to non singular but it also helps in uh, you know forming better idea of uh, of the uh, classification boundaries between these different classes so with shrinkage we've got 1.5% with off diagonal shrinkage we got 0.4% improvement and when we tune all these parameters together simultaneously we get around an accuracy improvement of uh, i mean uh, around around 4% compared to what it was earlier so this is the uh, you know this this shows that each component is actually important to to get the uh, you know i mean each component has potential to uh, fit this uh, you know to to um, fit this model uh, uh, to give a tight fit for the model yeah and uh, i mean uh, the effect this there's also an effect of scaling scaling euclidean so the distance that we saw earlier uh, we see that uh, you know with squared mahalanobis and squared squared euclidean even a general form of you know squared delta distance that we derived here the if you just scale your euclidean with a power m your accuracy improvement is uh, you know it's 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 on par with all the other distances that you can that you can uh, you know try out i mean all the all the different distances that you can try out so that's that's importance of uh, you know the scaling the euclidean distance when you construct the uh, the similarity of the k closest space classes so now this solution is actually a plug and play solution so this method allows like ready made off the shelf data augmentation which you know which is easily deployable because there's no uncertainty in prediction with deep neural networks there's no deep neural network at all and then it can use any pre trained feature extractor and therefore you can leverage transfer learning you can have like a feature extractor which was trained on like billions of images get the features and you know put this model to to work and then it is agnostic to data set so this idea equally translates to both text and image data sets and that's actually one of the future works so find out uh, you know try try establishing some benchmarks for text as well and uh, uh, i think uh, yeah so with that this is the paper that uh, i mean it, it's it's the preprint that we have and uh, you know feel free to uh, i mean um, go over uh, uh, these these uh, you know these subtle details of uh, of this uh, gdc method and uh, yeah with that uh, thanks thanks for attending we're we're happy to answer any questions if you have thanks a lot chakti sure pretty math heavy talk but i think you did a good job to make uh, the intuition behind what uh, you guys did pretty clear sure yeah thanks uh chazari has a question yes um, can you hear me yes yes sir. yeah thanks for the talk um it was really cool it was really nice to see that you got sort of it like i don't know i think that was it's very impressive um mm -hmm. i was wondering what your thoughts were for because you mentioned at the end applying this to text mm -hmm. um, the text is obviously a bit different because the um you're dealing in a more discrete kind of domain mm -hmm. so how do you think um, like what are your thoughts on trying to do this on text Yeah, so uh, for text, I think uh, uh, as long as uh, you're able to extract features for the text, I think uh, this algorithm. So let's let's go back to the algorithm again. This algorithm that you see, these features. So as long as you have these features for text, which are continuous, I think uh, this is uh, this can still be. Uh, I mean, that's that's our current idea. This can this can still be applied directly translate to. to text as well so these features i mean uh, let's say 
uh, features extracted from uh, from the BERT module, or uh, you know from the penultimate layer of a BERT classification model. So you know, I mean, it only has like a d-dimensional uh, you know space, and then you can uh, continue seeing if what are the different uh, you know uh, I mean uh, classes of of text uh, for uh, for that given uh, for that given text. What are the different classes of text which are close to it? And uh, the these labels for text could be, let's say, for uh, entity classification. I mean, you have a text, you need to find out, uh, or, or let's say, just text classification. You have a text, you need to find out, uh, you know, which of these discrete domains does the text lie in. So these YJ will be the labels of those uh, of those uh, different, uh, uh, you know, different categories of text. And if you can get continuous features for the text, then this method can, you know, directly translate into text as well. Yeah. Uh, does that does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm. I'm thinking more though, because that makes sense for classification. But I'm thinking more though for like, if you're trying to generate text mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. based on let's say very few examples of a certain style of text. Right. I guess you can really do generation here, could you? Right. Yeah. So for generation here, yeah. So generation here is generating features, sample features. So, um, I mean, um, uh, even, even the, the image, uh, you know, examples that we, that we uh, went about. So the image examples, it was not the pictures that we're uh, generating, it's the features that we're generating. And so this method definitely works on, uh, on uh, I mean, it's at a level higher than the, the raw data set. So you've got the text, you have the features, now let's say if you need more features for that specific class, then this can generate more features for, for that specific class itself. So feature to text translation back, I think uh, there may be methods to, to see how can we, I mean, which class is this text, you know, if this is this feature uh, more close to or, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that may be a, 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 a research problem. Yeah. To, translate these features back into text, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks very much, it's very interesting. Sure, yeah, yeah, no, these are, uh, that, that's a good point. I mean, it's these, these feature, these are features that we're sampling. These are, uh, so with text, it is, it's definitely, uh, I think uh, it is an open problem. I mean, if you can translate these features back to text, yeah. I have a question uh, related to one of the limitations, the one about uh, the limitation on the number of features mm -hmm. it could have, you know? I was just surprised by that because if I understood correctly, the original method, mm -hmm. so it was uh, limited, it, the pre-trained model couldn't have more feature dimensions than the number of points in each base class. So when you're talking about um, a like one shot or five shot, model. That means the the novel class could only have a single feature or five features. Right? Yeah, so these are, uh, so five shot, um, I mean, um, a five shot means five examples for novel class. Oh, right. Okay. Points in the base class. Correct. Yeah. So because, because uh, you know, we are trying to extrapolate the distribution of novel class from base classes based on the base classes. So the base classes should have non-singular covariances. And if the base classes have less number of points than the feature dimensions, then the covariance of that, of let's say this white wolf is calculate has like only seven points. So let's say five points. And the dimension of the feature here is eight. So D1 to D8. So this covariance uh, can actually be, you know, some of the rows of this covariance can be written as linear combination of the, of the other rows. And that means uh, this is not a, you know, um, uh, this is a singular covariance because of which you cannot construct a normal distribution on it. So yeah, this has to be, um, so, so you have to be careful that if you have five points in white wolf, then you need to find a feature extractor which gives you less than five dimensions so that this covariance can be non-singular. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Uh, also, Hussein has joined us. So hi, uh, Hussein. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I was a little late. I had another call to attend to. That's no problem. Yeah. So Manas has a question. By the way, um, we'll, we'll uh, stop the recording shortly and uh, end the academic portion of the of this session. But further questions about more uh, industry-related questions, et cetera, we can we'll take these after the, the recording.